Hey, what's up guys? Welcome to another episode of IGCC Biology Revision. Today we're going through the uh, topic of sexual reproduction in plants. So there's a lot to get through, so I want you to quickly read through the syllabus and we'll begin the video. So before we get into anything in detail, we need to understand the formal definition of asexual and sexual reproduction. Asexual being the process uh, resulting in the production of genetically identical offspring from one parent. Uh, the main thing here is that um, it's one parent and they're all genetically identical in terms of the offspring, so basically it's another word for cloning. And there's several advantages to this, that, uh, in that it's quicker, and one of the reasons being that only one parent is required for this, and so the good characteristics of the, of the parent will of course be passed on to the offspring because again it's cloning. Uh, but in, unlike in plants where the seed is dispersed, um, there's no dispersal or anything like that with asexual reproduction, so offspring will all grow in the same environment, and uh, that can be a good thing because if the environment is good, then it's good to grow your offspring there. But the main disadvantage of asexual reproduction is that you get little to no variation amongst the offspring, and therefore, if the environment is changing, which it often does, it's unlikely adapt to adapt to that. Uh, so for example, if the parent is not resistant to a certain disease, and if the disease hits, then none of the offspring will be uh, resistant to it either, and the whole species can essentially just die from that particular disease. Uh, so the lack of dispersal can actually be a bad thing as well, because um, if all the offspring is growing in the same environment, then you get more competition amongst offsprings for nutrients, water, and light, and that can also be, um, quite often be scarce. So just a diagrammatic uh, sort of uh, interpretation of asexual production. You've got one parent cell here, it produces another uh, an offspring basically which is exactly identical to the parent. But in sexual reproduction, which is obviously the main topic, it's a process involving the fusion of two gametes, and um, gametes are just another word for sex cells, and they form a zygote, and therefore they produce offspring that are genetically different from each other, and that's really good, because the main advantage of sexual reproduction is that it produces variation, and variation is good because it just means that uh, you have more adaptability to changing environments, and therefore the survivability increases. Uh, so more variation again means there's more sort of chance for some sort of resistance to arise, so let's just use the example of uh, disease again. If an unfavorable sort of disease hits, uh, the more variation you have, the more chance you have to survive that. And in plants, you know, seed dispersal will allow less competition since the offspring will grow elsewhere, so you're not competing for water, nutrients, and things like that, which is, which is a good thing. The main disadvantages of uh, sexual reproduction is basically the whole process is a lot slower, and you need two parents, so when you have two parents and you need two cells to combine, and fuse, and develop, all that stuff takes a long time. So basically we've got one parent here, another parent there, they're different, and the offspring will also be different from the parents, and the offspring will also be different from other offspring, so a lot of variation. So there's two main types of flowers that we'll be looking at today, and you're expected to know uh, the main structure. Uh, yeah, you, you're, you're, you're expected to label all the structures of the flower if you're given a diagram and whatnot. Uh, the two main things you'll be looking at is insect pollinated and wind pollinated. And pollination basically just means uh, the, the transfer of pollen from the anther to the stigma, but we'll look at that in a second. So the main things you'll be looking at is the carpel, which is the female reproductive uh, part of the flower, and it contains three structures. You've got the stigma, which uh, is a sticky surface that catches pollen. We've got the style, which is this long sort of rod that uh, connects the stigma to the ovary, and you've got the ovary, which contains ovules, which is the female sex cell. Uh, 
So if you have a female sex cell and a female reproductive part, you need to have a male reproductive part, which is the stamen. The stamen contains the anther and the filament. The anther contains the pollen, which is the male sex cell, and the filament, which basically supports the anther. And we talked about sexual reproduction being that uh, the male and the female sex cell has to fuse with each other, um, in order to make an offspring, so this is no different here. The main point of reproduction for plants and flowers will be that the anther, which contains the pollen, we need to somehow uh, transfer the pollen from the anther all the way to the ovule here, which is the female, uh, the female sex cell, and once those two combine, uh, then we've basically got a uh, fertilized, fertilized egg, or sorry, the uh, fertilized ovule, which will make a seed eventually. Uh, so we'll talk about how, how that happens in a second, but either way, just focus on the structures and the next one being sepal, which protects the flower in a bud, so it's just a tough little protective structure. And you've got the flower, which is exclusively only an insect poll pollinated flowers, and uh, that will attract uh, insects. And the stalk will obviously um, uphold the flower to, um, to support that. So. An insect pollinator flower basically allows um, pollination to happen through uh, through insects, right? So the insects will actually come, like this bee here, and physically rub on the anther, and so a little bit of pollen will get onto the the fur of the insect, and the insect will sort of move around the flower, and somehow by chance the the pollen that was stuck onto the insect will actually land on the stigma, and from there the pollen will actually make its way to the ovule for fertilization. So the main thing here at this point is insect pollinated flower basically uses insects physically as a medium to transfer pollen from the anther to the sigma, right? And wind pollinated flowers are different in that uh, they rely on the wind to carry uh, the pollen from the anther to the stigma. Again, that's the definition of pollina pollination, and um, but it's just two different ways in which pollination can happen, either by you know insects physically rubbing on it or by wind. So there's there's two mediums and two types of flowers. Cambridge sort of wants you to understand the main differences though, and uh, we'll take a look at that. The uh, insect pollinated flowers will also always have petals, and wind pollinated flowers won't, and that's pretty obvious. Petals act to attract insects, and wind pollinated flowers don't actually need insects at all. They rely basically on wind, so they don't need petals. Uh, the stamen, which is the male reproductive part, will be inside the flower of an insect pollinated flower, and so that's quite uh, self-explanatory because that increases the chance of uh, an insect coming like this bee and actually physically rubbing on it and um, hopefully a bit of pollen sticks on it, right? And, and when pollinated, it'll be outside the flower sort of dangling because it, it needs to be, allow itself to be exposed to the wind and the wind can help carry the pollen um, to, the, to the stigma somewhere. Right, so the stigma is also different. The uh, stigma is also inside the flower for an insect pollination, um, pollinated flower, and that's you know the same reason why the stamen is inside. It just allows more chance of an insect just rubbing on it. And um, for a wind pollinated flower, the stigmas are often quite large and feathery, and quite often they're again hanging outside the flower because you want it to be exposed to the wind and uh, the wind um, hopefully will be carrying some pollen for it to stick onto the stigma and therefore you know that's that's pollination the pollen itself is different in that uh, for an insect pollinator flower it'll be produced in smaller amounts but it can be sort of sticky and spiky again because that's what uh, that's what they want they want the pollen to hook onto the fur of the insect and um, you know, allow the insect to carry it to the, the stigma. Whereas in wind pollinated, uh, it has to be produced in a larger amount because a lot of the pollen will actually just be lost in the wind. And they're also smooth and light to allow it to be a bit more um, lighter and uh, get carried more easily in the wind and find itself um, on the stamen of either the same or a different plant. So I want to take a look at pollination in a bit more detail. Again, it's the transfer of pollen, which is the male sex cell, to the uh, from the anther to the stigma.
Now, so we've got the pollen here, which is in inside the anther, and it gets transferred to the stigma, and it makes its way to the ovary, uh, ovary, yep, and uh, specifically the ovule though, which is the female sex organ, uh, sorry, the sex cell, and when they fuse, it uh, becomes a zygote. And so, basically here what's happening is that uh, the pollen is transferred from the anther to the stigma of the exact same plant, and that's called self-pollination. But, uh, what can also happen is that the pollen from the anther of this plant can actually trans get transferred to the stigma of another plant, and that's called cross-pollination, because it's going from one flower to a different flower, as opposed to the same flower. So there's benefits, I suppose, of certain things. You've got self-pollination being beneficial because there's higher chance of fertilization actually happening. So if a bee comes over and sort of muddles around inside this flower, there's a lot more chance that uh, fertilization will actually happen and that uh, the, the, the insect will move around, uh, catch some pollen from here and transfer it directly over to here. Um, the, the only disadvantage of that is that although it increases the chance of fertilization, uh, you get less variation because everything is happening within the same plant. Um, in terms of cross-pollination, where the insect uh, actually carries some pollen from this plant and transfers it all the way here, and the pollen actually sticks onto the stigma of a different plant, uh, the fertilization chance is actually reduced because uh, it's less likely that it will happen. Um, but once it does happen, it's better because there's more variation. Now that you have two flowers involved, you get mixing of more genes and therefore more variation. Uh, so specifically, we understand that pollen is the transfer of... Uh, sorry, we, we understand that pollination is the transfer of pollen from the anther all the way to the stigma. And so let's take a look at how fertilization happens, which is when the pollen or the nucleus within the pollen actually combines with the ovule, which is inside the ovary in this region here. So let's just zoom up on that. Uh, so the pollen somehow ends up on the stigma. Again, it can either be by wind or insect, or it can either be cross or self-pollinated. Either way, what happens then is that we actually get something for, called a pollen tube, and it's this little tube that actually starts from all the way up here and digs its way down like a little tunnel all the way around and down below, and uh, what that little tunnel does is it allows the male nucleus, which is actually hiding inside the olin, to get excreted out and pass through this pollen tube and of course eventually make its way through to the ovule. Now when the ovule, which contains the female nucleus, combines with the male nucleus, which is originally from the pollen, when that happens then of course fertilization has happened and you have uh, you have finally um, ultimately formed the zygote and that is indeed sexual reproduction of a plant. And there's this little thing called micropile here, it's a little tube that actually connects uh, connects the pollen tube to the ovule, which is sort of inside, deep inside the ovary, and um, you know, once the ovule gets uh, fertilized, and i.e. combined with the male nucleus, then it becomes a seed, and of course the seed then gets dispersed, and uh, germination is then the process in which that seed becomes a plant. And the main factors that affect germination is water, oxygen, and temperature. And those three things are something that you need to be aware of. So guys, um, again, thank you so much for watching. I know it's a pretty content-heavy topic, so, um, you know, I think if you just watch the video enough, you should understand the basic concepts, but please uh, do sort of um, expose yourself to other forms of uh, revision as well, not just my videos. Um, you know, read your textbooks, read your notes and all that, but um, I hope this video has served as a good sort of basis and a foundation for the first topic inside the larger topic of reproduction. And uh, we'll take a look at human reproduction in, in the next video.